Hey y'all, howdy. Welcome to One for the Books. I'm Sandra Broadwell. Today we'll be discussing Caliban's War, which is book two of the Expanse series by James S.A. Corey. The material in this book basically covers season two, episode six, through season three, episode six of the TV adaptation of the series, which you can view on Prime Video. If you haven't seen my video of the book one, season one comparison, you can check that out here, and I will also link it in the description below. Let's start with the caveats. First, this video is going to be entirely spoilers. I am going to give an overall plot synopsis, and then I'm going to talk about the major differences that I noticed between the book and the TV show, and which medium I thought did which parts better. And then at the end, I'll kind of give my overall thoughts about which one would win if I could only choose one. Let's dive in. If you have read The Expanse or watched the TV show, be sure to let me know what you think of my takes in the comments below and which ones you thought did better. Now I'm going to jump into the plot synopsis, so if you want to just skip this part and go straight ahead to my opinions and analysis, you can skip ahead to this time, and I'll see you there. Plot synopsis. Our point of view characters in Caliban's War are Holden, Prax, Bobby, and Avasarala. This book kicks off on Ganymede, a Jovian moon known for its agricultural exports and as being a safe place to birth children in the belt. We see May, a young girl with a rare medical disorder, removed from her daycare by Dr. Strickland and a woman posing as May's mother. In the meantime, MCRN soldier Bobby Draper is doing routine patrols on the surface of Ganymede when she and her team witness a group of UN soldiers rushing toward them, being chased by a creature without a spacesuit. They try to shoot the creature, but it seems to have no effect. The creature takes out her entire team before it suddenly explodes. The unexpected space battle between the MCRN and the UN ships above Ganymede Ganymede goes awry, causing orbital mirrors to crash into the Ganymede base, destroying much of the station. Prax goes to the daycare center to try to pick up his daughter May after the attack, but finds out she is missing. When Prax is told she was picked up by a woman assumed to be her mother, he immediately knows something is wrong, and he spends weeks looking for her among the wreckage of the base. The crew of the Rocinante are contacted by Fred Johnson of the OPA and asked to go to Ganymede to see if they can figure out what's going on. Prax gives up his food rations to a hacker in exchange for video surveillance footage of May's daycare before the attack, but the hacker extorts him for more than he has. When Prax sees Holden on Ganymede, he recognizes him from news broadcasts and asks him for help finding his daughter. The crew go with Prax to get footage, and they see that May was removed from the daycare by Dr. Strickland, and he took her to an unused part of the base. They go to that part of the base, and when they bust in, they end up in a shootout with the folks in the lab. A bunch of people die, and when they find spilled protomolecule goo, Holden freaks out and they evacuate with Prax in tow. Avasarella's boss, Aaron Wright, puts her on task of the Venus investigation with a blank check, but she realizes he's just trying to maneuver her out of the conversations about the Earth-Mars conflict. Avasarala hires Bobby to help her investigate what's happening on Venus. As the Rossi is escaping Ganymede, they find out that a protomolecule monster snuck on board their ship and has been stowing away in the cargo hold. Holden and Amos attack it, but it attacks back and traps Holden. They realize the creature is feeding off a radiation leak, so Prax goes outside the ship and throws some radioactive bait. The creature follows the bait off the ship, but leaves a bomb behind. Alex then uses Rossi's thrusters to burn up the creature, but the bomb goes off inside the cargo bay. Back on Earth, Bobby suspects that Avasarala's assistant is leaking information from her office and follows him. When she reveals this to Avasarala, she believes that Aaron Wright is behind it and that he's been working with Protogen all along, so she goes to question him. Aaron Wright realizes he's up against a wall and sends Avasarala to Ganymede aboard Jules Pierre Mouse ship as a way to supposedly help her investigation. Avasarala is suspicious, but she doesn't know how to get out of it without losing her political influence, so she agrees but takes Bobby with her. Mao is supposed to be on the ship with them, but at the last second makes an excuse and Avasarala realizes it's a trap. The crew of the Rossi go back to Tycho Station to get their ship repaired and Holden confronts Fred Johnson about whether or not he or the OPA were involved with the protomolecule showing up on Ganymede. Fred gets pissed and basically fires Holden since they were using Rossinante as a contract ship. Prax in the meantime is still trying to find a way to find May. Holden broadcasts out a message about May's story and it causes one of Prax's former colleagues to reach out saying she knows Dr. Strickland and that that's actually a false name for a protogen employee. They realize the protomolecule monsters they've encountered thus far have had bombs built into them so that they can be destroyed if they can't be controlled, but the monsters are figuring out how to remove them. Prax deduces that May's medical condition might make her an excellent person to experiment on with the protomolecule because her body would not be able to reject the alien DNA. Prax's campaign for May via Holden's message gains a lot of traction. Avasarala tunes into the story because she believes Prax and the crew of the Rossinante are getting close to the truth, and Aaron Wright and Protogen are attempting to discredit them. She then learns they are sending 
attempts to stop them. She tries to send a message to Holden to warn him, but finds that her communications have been blocked and she truly is a captive on Jewel Pierre Mao's ship. She then sends Bobby to commandeer the ship with her MCR and armor that she snuck aboard. Officer Alla meets up with the crew of the Rocinante so they can put their information together and figure out what's going on. They realize that the protomolecule monsters are interacting with the protomolecule crash site on Venus in real time. When Officer Alla can't get Aaron Wright to divert his attack, she sends the info they know to others at the UN that she trusts and reaches out to the closest Martian military ships to ask for aid, saying she's about to be attacked by a rogue element of the UN. A standoff takes place between Mars and the rogue UN ships. Some shots are fired, but the heroes prevail. Officer Alla tells the Secretary General what happened, and Aaron Wright is ousted, but they then divert the fleet to Io, where there is a protogen lab they believe has been creating the protomolecule monsters. The base on Io responds by launching a bunch of missiles armed with the monsters. Amos and Prax go inside the lab to try and find May, while Bobby stays outside to fight a protomolecule creature, and the rest of the crew is tied up in the epic space battle above Io. Amos and Prax find Dr. Strickland, May, and the rest of the captive children. Amos kills Dr. Strickland, and they save all of the children. Jules Pierre Mao is finally arrested, and Prax gets put in charge of rebuilding Ganymede. When missiles filled with protomolecule monsters approach Tycho Station, Fred Johnson nukes them, which causes the crash site on Venus to erupt with black filaments that shoot out into space. In the last scene of the book, Detective Miller, glowing with blue protomolecule specks, appears before Holden and says, we gotta talk. So first things I want to talk about are Prax and the whole Ganymede situation overall, because I think these parts of the story were told quite differently in the book and the show. Prax's emotion about May going missing, I feel like was much more heavily felt when I read the book versus when I watched the show. You really feel when you're reading the story how devastated Prax is by the fact that his daughter is missing versus when I watched it on the show, the most thing that I felt from Prax was kind of like this PTSD sort of numbness, but not as much the emotional turmoil. The entire way that the book handled Prax recovering from this attack on Ganymede was very different. Um, so in the show, Prax basically wakes up on board a refugee ship that is leaving Ganymede and his friend gets spaced. It's, it's a very dramatic scene. That never happens in the book. In the book, Prax stays on the surface of Ganymede because he is so desperate to find May, he doesn't leave. So in that way, I do think that the book did a much better job of showing the absolute devastation on Ganymede and the desperate situation that all of the citizens are a part of down there because they suddenly have no food, much of their areas are destroyed, there are so many people who have died, and they're slowly starving to death while they wait for aid. In the book, you really feel like how desperate everyone is for food and how their entire society is really breaking down very quickly. Versus in the show, you really only get to find find out what's happening on Ganymede from the perspective of the crew, which is a much different perspective than someone who has been living and trying to survive on Ganymede post-attack. Then there's this great scene where after they view the footage of what happened or where May was taken and they bust into the lab, Amos gives Prax a gun. And that was a really stupid decision on Amos's part because Prax is like a botanical engineer. You know, he's never dealt with a gun in his life and he doesn't really know how these sorts of situations go down. And because of Prax fumbling around with his gun, everyone in the lab assumes that they're under attack and they end up in this kind of Mexican standoff situation. And the shootout really is all his fault because he just didn't know how to respond in the face of a gun. And he's like pretty delirious at that point. He's like half starved to death. And so I I just really thought that it was a good characterization moment for Prax and Amos for you to really realize that the crew of the Rocinante are not heroes, that they make poor decisions just like everyone else and trying to do what's right doesn't always result in the best outcome. Also, there is a little bit of a bromance that I felt when I was watching the show between Amos and Prax. And they have a good friendship in the book, but I felt like it was more just Amos was treating him like a member of the crew versus when I watched it on the show, I really felt like they had a really strong like besties sort of connection. And so I missed that a little bit when I read the book after having seen the show first. There's also this whole backstory of Amos where he was sexually abused as a child. They kind of hint around that in the show, but in the book, they just come out 
out and say it here in book two. And in the show, I don't think they really make that abundantly clear until like season five. So I thought that was interesting way to characterize Amos early on and show why it was so important to him to rescue May and why he felt this connection to Prax because protecting children who are in vulnerable situations is something that Amos cares very deeply about. There's also a huge difference in Katoa. So Katoa was this little boy that was in May's daycare or school and they were friends. Prax was also friends with Katoa's parents. And in the book, Katoa's parents assumed that that Katoa died in the attack on Ganymede. They end up leaving on refugee ships and Prax stays behind because he's convinced May is still alive and he just has to find her. And then what happens after that plays out very differently between the book and the show, because in the book, when they bust into the lab on Ganymede to try and find May, they end up seeing Katoa's body just like laid out on, on a lab table and he's dead. And it's clear that they've been running protomolecule experiments on him. And so it is this really tragic moment where Prax thinks that May is probably dead as well. But in the show, this is actually developed in a whole different way, which I thought was really interesting because it gave us a much deeper perspective of what Protogen was actually doing with the protomolecule. In the show, Katoa is not killed on Ganymede. He's taken to the Protogen base on Io. There he is injected with all this protomolecule stuff, and we get to see kind of how he evolves over time and gets it's tuned in to the kind of alien hive mind. And that's how we find out that the alien protomolecule has a hive mind um, and is connected to Venus. Versus in the book, we only find out about the hive mind through this message or data that Ava Sarala is reading about what's happening on Venus. And then Prax kind of makes the connection later. But basically, in the book, we only find out what Protogen is doing by piecing together the pieces of information that our point of view characters have versus in the show, we actually get to see them doing all this experimentation on Katoa. And there's this like horrific scene where Katoa like takes apart one of the doctors or lab techs and that kind of stuff. So I think that was really impactfully done in the TV show and was a great way to show us what was happening and what Protogen was trying to accomplish with these protomolecule creatures that they were creating. The next big difference that I noticed was basically Ava Sarala's story. First, as you know, if you watched my first video or if, if you read and watched both the books and the show, Ava Sarala was not a character in book one, but she was a character in season one of the show. So she's just introduced in book two, but her story is continuing through season two. When you first meet Ava Sarala in season one of the show, she is torturing a belter. She has him like hanging on some hooks and it has to do with her being very upset about her son who was apparently killed by some belters or I, I'm not ex exactly sure how it all went down but that's that's basically what I remember. In the book that torture scene never happens and Avasarala's son was like a 15 year old who died in a skiing accident so he was never a part of the military, he was never killed by belters, any of that. So that was a really interesting characterization moment that they gave us at the beginning of the show to show us I think like how fierce and sometimes misguided Avasarala can be. Then there's the difference in Avasarala's story and her interactions with Aaron Wright, who is her superior in the UN. In the book, she finds out that Aaron Wright is a traitor, kind of through Bobby following her assistant Soren, and basically Avasarala just like outmaneuvers Aaron Wright and he ends up retiring in shame. Versus in the show, Avasarala finds out that Aaron Wright is a traitor when she's on board or Jules Pierre Mao's ship and like literally sees him come on the screen and tell Jules Pierre Mao or whoever to murder her basically. And then she captures that video footage and sends it back to the UN. And so he gets arrested and it's much more dramatic. So that was an interesting difference. I don't know that I prefer either of them, but it's certainly made for good TV. In the show, I don't think Avasarala even has an assistant named Soren, which was like a whole thing that happened in the book. There's also this character named Kotyar 
I think is how you say it, who in the show is uh, like this, I guess, ex-military guy that was friends with her son in the military, and he ends up kind of becoming her personal bodyguard slash assistant person. And he, I thought, was a really excellent character. So I was glad that they added him to the show. In the book, there is a character named Katyar, and he is helping Avasarala as a security person on board the ship, but that's basically his only part of the plot, and he isn't really seen outside of the ship, and he doesn't uh, die in a shootout. In the book, because Bobby was able to sneak her power suit on board, she very easily overpowers like the entire security of the ship, because don't ever mess around with a Martian with power armor. <laughs> Holy shit. And so those, those scenes play out very differently. There's also differences in how the crew personalities start to show through and their interactions amongst each other. So Holden and Naomi are, I think they started hooking up in the first book, but their relationship was um, kind of kept secret. And so it's not until book two that they actually come out to the rest of the crew and let them know that they're a couple. In the show, Holden and Naomi, I think when they tell Alex and Amos um, that they're together. They already knew and had been taking bets on this relationship and things. And in the book, they didn't know, but and Amos just like all of a sudden, like he has this epiphany and he just blurts it out and he goes like, you guys are hooking up or you guys are sleeping together or something. It was this really funny moment. But I thought that both of the way that the crew was told about Holden and Naomi, both in the show and the book was just like really funny and heartwarming. Uh, so I didn't have a preference between those. I thought they were both great. And then in the book, to me, Alex just mostly fulfills the role of like a pilot versus in the show. I think he's uh, a lot more charismatic. He's often portrayed as like the chef for the crew. He's always like cooking them meals and stuff. And he really feels a lot like the glue of their little family. Sometimes he's like always trying to make sure that everyone's relationships are good. And he does in the show as well. I don't know, for some reason it just came through in the show. Yeah, a little bit more charismatic than how I read him when I was reading the book. There's also this whole thing where in the show, show, Alex has a kid back on Mars that he abandoned along with his ex-wife versus in the book, he does have an ex-wife back on Mars. And there is like a missive, like some background info that Avasarala is reading about the crew of the Rocinante to get to know them better. And it states in, in Alex's info that he has a child, but he doesn't know that he does. And that's the only time it ever comes up in the book series as a whole, that he had this whole child that he didn't know about um, back on Mars. So I thought that was really interesting because knowing that he intentionally chose to abandon his child um, when he's on the show versus him having a kid that he didn't know about and he never finds out about um, through the course of the series definitely gives you a slightly different impression of who this person is. The other major difference that I noticed when reading versus watching this part of The Expanse was Bobby's first interaction with the protomolecule creature and what happens at the UN because of that. So these were handled very differently in the book and in the show. So as you know, if you listen through my synopsis that I gave, Bobby and her crew of um, MCRN soldiers are just patrolling out on Ganymede and they see a creature without a spacesuit chasing UN soldiers towards them. They try to attack the creature and it decimates her entire crew and then it blows up. So she very clearly knows there was some sort of weird alien thing. And when she wakes up and tries to tell her superiors about it, they don't believe her, but she has camera footage from her suit. And so then they watch it and they're like, oh shit. So after that, because of the stuff that happens, Bobby is called to earth to basically be a witness before the UN, the UN and Mars are having these talks 
and they want to hear her testimony about what happened. But when she arrives, the UN already knows what happens because Mars sent her footage ahead and they've already had these discussions without her being a part of it. And so she was mostly there to corroborate her side of the story with what they already knew. So that's handled very differently in the show. In the show, they make it pretty clear that Bobby and her crew are out patrolling on Ganymede and they see these UN soldiers running towards them and they're like, what the hell's going on? Are they going to attack us? And they think that the UN is like making some half cock measure to literally come and attack them. And so I think they, they're like really torn as to whether or not to start shooting at the UN soldiers because they think they're coming at them and they don't really see the other creature until later. And then when she wakes up and, you know, she has PTSD or whatever. There is no footage uh, from her suit and her superiors in the Martian military basically try to gaslight her and tell her that it's PTSD. You don't really know what you saw. You're just upset because your whole crew died. They take her to Earth again to be a witness and talk about her experience, but they basically give her a script and they're like, don't go off the script you need to make it really clear that we did all the right things here. So Earth has no idea that there was this protomolecule creature out on the surface of Ganymede. And they think that this is just about the Earth-Mars conflict and they don't really know what's going on. So that's why they called Mars to Earth so they could question them about like, what the hell just happened with this battle on Ganymede and why are we fighting? So it plays out very differently. Bobby gets really pissed that her superiors are treating her like this after she's been such a loyal Marine her whole, you know, adult life. And she ends up defecting basically and asking for sanctuary on earth so that she can be free to speak her mind and try to get to the bottom of this sort of mystery. In the book, Bobby does end up working for Avasarala, but it's like with permission from her Martian superiors. And she's like a liaison uh, between the two versus a lot more conflict. I didn't really think the explanation for why Bobby was to work for Avasarala made very much sense in either the book or the show, even though they handled it differently both ways. Bobby was a very dedicated Martian and it was just hard for me to wrap my head around um, why she would work for Avasarala in either case, though it did make more sense in the book. I really hated the way that the Martians treated Bobby and gaslit her. And I thought that the actual overall way that it played out in the book where she had a recording of the protomolecule creature and Earth already knew about it by the time that she got there. I thought all of that, the way it played out in the book, made a lot more sense than the way that it played out in the show. Then we have the Battle of Io, which is basically where the Protogen Lab was. There is this mass confusion where UN ships are firing on each other because, you know, some of them are traitors and are trying to cover up the protomolecule business and trying to kill Avasarala and Holden and his crew. Space, space battles are just always, they're, they're just so rad. I really think it's interesting the way that they portray space battles in the book. You get a better sense of the scale when you're reading the book because you read things like they're a thousand kilometers away, which you're like, okay, that's really, really far. But then a thousand kilometers for them is like, they're right on our ass. Like we got to get the hell out of here. And so, yeah, just the, like the, the epic scale of space is, I, I feel like I felt it more when I was reading the book. Of course, you know, the show, has like this god's eye view where you can actually see all the spaceships like maneuvering and shooting at each other and I mean that's just excellent cinematic television right but in the book you always get kind of the more character eye view of what's happening and so you really get their emotions more and it humanizes this more abstract like oh they're firing at us you know like that that kind of thing. Um, space battles are a lot more confusing, I think, when you're just a tiny piece of it uh, versus when you get this whole look at what's happening at all at the same time. So I think that both the book and the show played to their medium's strengths in that way, 
when it comes to depicting the battles. I think that the book does a great job helping us feel the confusion and the emotion and the fear and the pain that comes with the battle. And the show just just shows us really badass shit happening. So that's the best of both worlds. So those are the major differences that I noticed between Caliban's War and season two plus of the show. I think my overall feeling on this one is because I really felt the impact and the desperation and the starvation and the fear of what was happening on Ganymede from Prax's perspective. And also because I liked the way that they handled Bobby's interaction with the UN and the way that her team handled the first interaction with the protomolecule monster. Because I thought both of those were done better in the book, I'm edging this one towards the book did it better. Season one was the opposite of that. I thought season one I liked better in the show. Book two, I think, takes it over season two. That's pretty much it for this video. If you guys liked this, um, please be sure to like the video. Spread it around to your other friends who watch The Expanse. If this video performs well, then I will plan to continue with the series and go all the way through season six, book six, where the show cut off. Yeah, I'm having a lot of fun with this. I really love this series and um, hope I can share that love with you all. As always, thank you for tuning in. Be kind, read books, and hit the subscribe button below for more bookish content to come.